Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are in a series I've titled Studies in Jeremiah, and we've been in Jeremiah 31, a very important passage, and we're continuing in that. We covered the first half last week, and this morning we're looking at verses 27 through the end to verse 40. So I'm going to read all of that passage. It's rather lengthy, but we'll be coming to all these points, and I want to familiarize you with them before we do that in our study. But beginning with verse 27, we read, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. As I have watched over them to pluck up to break down, to overthrow, to destroy, and to bring disaster. So I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days they will not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge, but everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor, and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is His name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cut off all the offspring of Israel for all they have done, declares the Lord. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city will be rebuilt for the Lord from whom the tower of Hanael to the corner of to the corner gate. The measuring line will go out farther straight ahead of the hill Gareb, then it will turn to Goa. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kidron to the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be holy to the Lord. It will not be plucked up or overthrown anymore forever. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In Hyde Park in London is Speaker's Corner, a place of public speeches and debate. And so the story goes, there was once a debate between a communist and a Christian. As the communist was speaking, he saw a man in the audience dressed in rags. He pointed to him and said, communism can put a new suit of clothes on that man. And he felt triumphant with that point. But then the Christian responded, Christ can put a new man in those clothes. And that's true. He makes all things new. He makes us into a new creation. The reason for that is the subject of our passage. It should be familiar to many of you on Sunday evenings before we take the Lord's Supper. It is not uncommon for someone to read either Luke 
chapter 22, verse 20, or 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25, where Christ said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That expression, the new covenant, comes from Jeremiah 31, probably the best known chapter in the book of Jeremiah, certainly one of the best known chapters in the Old Testament, and certainly one of the most important because it is here God signaled that a new age of grace would replace the old one governed by the covenant that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. And so we come to our study of Jeremiah 31, verses 27 through 40, and the new covenant. Well, what is a covenant? When I, my, my daughters were young, I taught them from the Catechism for Young Children. And it defines a covenant very simply as an agreement between two or more persons. If you do this, then I will do that. If you give me this amount of money, I will give you this piece of land. That's basically a covenant. And that was true of the covenant that God made at Sinai. It was an agreement He made with Israel if the nation kept His law then he would bless them. If they failed to obey, he would curse them. And so when they entered the land uh, and came to Shechem under Joshua, they stood on two mountains, one on Mount Gerizim and one, uh, one group, and the other half of the tribes of Israel on Mount Ebal. And from Mount Gerizim, they pronounced the curses, or rather the blessings of, uh, of the covenant and on Mount Ebal, they pronounced the curses. It's all found in Deuteronomy 28, the blessings and the curses. The blessings are great. The curses, though, are many, and they are frightful. When it was given, this covenant, the mountains smoked and quaked. There was fire and darkness, whirlwind and gloom. The people were terrified by all of it, and they cried out in fear for their lives. Even Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. It all indicated the severity of the covenant. And yet even before Moses came down off the mountain with the tablets of the law in his hand, the people had broken it and committed idolatry with the golden calf. So, the Old Covenant with the Ten Commandments could make people fear, but it couldn't make them obey. And they inevitably came under the curses of that awesome covenant. That is why Paul called it a ministry of death in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, and said it brings about wrath in Romans chapter 4, verse 15. The quaking mountain on fire and smoking like a furnace indicated all of that. It's not that the law is bad. The law is not bad. The law is holy and good. The problem is man. The problem is men and women. We are fallen and we are sinful. We cannot obey the law and keep the covenant. Cannot. In fact, when Joshua was giving his final sermon to the nation in Joshua 24, he told them, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. That's how one keeps the law, in sincerity and truth. Not just outwardly, but inwardly. But then only a few verses later he said, you will not be able to serve the Lord, for He is holy. And their whole history proved that statement. They routinely sinned and broke the covenant. And the broken law of the covenant condemned them. So something else was needed. A new covenant, different from the old one. And that covenant was promised in Jeremiah 31. In fact, it's not altogether new. Earlier covenants were made with Abraham and David that gave the promise of seed or descendants and a king and a kingdom. Abraham was forgiven and justified through faith alone. That's Genesis 15, 6. 
The Old Testament promises forgiveness. We have that all through it. One of the best known passages is Psalm 103, verse 12, that God will remove transgressions as far as the east is from the west. So the new covenant is really an expression or renewal of those earlier gracious covenants of God. They are unilateral covenants, meaning they are one-sided covenants. They are dependent only on one party of the covenant, and that is the Lord God, and He's faithful. And so it is with this new covenant. The author of Hebrews calls it a better covenant. The reason is, it's not so much an agreement between persons as a promise that God made to bless His people with salvation. It is, as I said, an unconditional covenant, a gracious covenant, a sovereign promise that He has made. And the grace of it is made clear by the events that were occurring when the promise was given in Jeremiah's day. They were terrible events. We've covered them somewhat. The northern kingdom, Israel, was gone carried off a hundred years before by the Assyrians, and now Judah, the southern kingdom, was being judged for its covenantal violations, its idolatry, its sin, its unfaithfulness to God. The Babylonians had come. They would break down Jerusalem's walls and burn its temple and take its people away into captivity. It was a bleak time when it seemed that the end had come. That's when God spoke words of hope. Behold, days are coming, He said. Days when He will restore everything. He says in verse 27 that He will plant the nation and make it grow. That's confirmed at the end of the prophecy in verse 38 where He says that He will rebuild Jerusalem. And it will not be overthrown anymore forever. It will never again suffer destruction. Now that hasn't happened yet, but that's the promise. That indicates the sovereignty of God that keeps it safe, but also a significant change in the nation that will, will not only be restored and regathered, but will be righteous. He has sovereign control over all things to punish and to bless. But He will bless the nation, not only with restoration, but with righteousness. The nation will be right with God, justified by God. It does mean that, this text, and, it, and He indicates that with a proverb that was common among the exiles in Babylon. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. It was a, a statement, really, of self-pity, stating that God was punishing them with captivity unjustly for the sins of previous generations. But that blame shifting will cease, is what Jeremiah is saying. In the future, Israel will not say that. They will acknowledge their sin. They will not pass it off unto others. They will own up to their own failures and their guilt, and they will bear their own responsibility, and they will repent. There will be no repentance until one understands that he or she is a sinner, not right with God, and the only way to that is through faith and repentance in the Lord. Well, they will do that. There will be change. Change of heart and faith. They will become obedient people because the Lord will make and implement a new covenant with the nation. That's the promise of verses 31 and 32. There will be a new relationship. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. It's an amazing statement he makes. I took them out of Egypt by the hand, led them out of slavery. I was a husband to them as they broke the covenant. Without a sense of gratitude, 
It's pure rebellion. Well, this is not the first place in the Old Testament where a promise of, of God's kingdom age for Israel is given, but it is the only place it, that this exact phrase, new covenant, is found. And, and it was needed. Israel was incapable of keeping the old or the Mosaic covenant. So in His grace, God would provide a new covenant which would supersede the old, replace the old. And that replacement would not come immediately. The Mosaic covenant would govern the lives of the people until Christ came and inaugurated the new covenant through His death on the cross. But by rejecting Christ, Israel also forfeited their place in that covenant and a new people, believing people, the church, and largely Gentiles, through their faith in Him, received it and entered into that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul speaks of the apostles as being ministers of a new covenant. Still, the statement in verse 31 is that this covenant was promised not to the Gentiles, not to us, not to the church. It was promised to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It's very specific. Paul explained what happened in Romans 11, verses 11 through 32. We, we looked at that last week, the parable of the olive tree. Israel was broken off, broken out of the natural branches, taken away from that olive tree. There's still a remnant in it. A few Jews believed and remain, and there's always been a remnant. But the nation as a whole has been taken out of the olive tree with all of its blessings, and believing Gentiles has been, have been grafted in to that tree, to those blessings and that covenant. But that situation for Israel is only temporary. In the future, Israel will be reunited and saved and grafted back into that tree. Paul said in Romans 11 and verse 23 that God is able to do that. He's telling Gentiles, don't be arrogant because you've been grafted in and they've been broken off. God's able to bring them back in and God will in fact do that. That's the promise here. You find it other places in different language, different words. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 through chapter 13, verse 1, we have this same prophecy. The prophecy begins with the people of Israel mourning, grieving. It ends, in that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. It will be a day of blessing for the Gentiles as well as for the Jews, for the whole world. Paul said that in Romans 11 and verse 12. If their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? Since Jewish rejection of Christ and the covenant resulted in the gospel and salvation going broadly to the Gentiles, then by force of logic, Jewish repentance and salvation will result in greater blessings for the Gentiles, for the world. It will be a golden age. In the remaining verses, the Lord gives the content of the covenant, the promises of it and the uh, nature of it. It is, an, as I said, an unconditional covenant and an eternal covenant that, that promises regeneration, reconciliation, reunification, forgiveness, knowledge. It promises the new birth and the new world. And its success is assured. God has spoken. So, it certainly is a better covenant with better promises, as the author of Hebrews said. Verses 33 and 34 show the difference between the new and the old covenants. Verse 33, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it. 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The first difference between the two covenants is seen in the manner in which God's guidance would be transmitted to the people. Rather than guiding them from outside through the law written on tablets of stone, His law would be written on their hearts. That is a complete change. And the change that is made here is the change that makes the difference. He will make it internal. He will make it natural. The the covenant and its principles of conduct will be written deeply within them, in their wills, so that they will obey from choice and not from compulsion. In Romans 8 and verse 3, Paul speaks of what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. The law, in and of itself, can't change us because our flesh is weak. It can order us and it can condemn us for not obeying, but it cannot change us. It cannot make us obey. A Jewish man, if maybe you've seen this, I've seen this on airplanes traveling to Israel. Jewish men putting on phylacteries, going over to a window of the plane as the sun's rising and, and praying toward Jerusalem. And they'll put their prayer shawls on and they'll put the phylacteries on. Those uh, boxes, leather boxes that contain the Torah and they'll strap them onto their forehead and they'll strap them onto their right arm. They can do that and they can go through a a ceremony with great devotion, but that won't give them the power to obey. Those, Those words that are contained in those boxes on their head and on their arm, they can't empower them to do anything. So God puts the law within us, not on us, not in boxes, not on doorposts, in us, in our hearts. All of which is to say that he will give a, cause a fundamental change in their nature by giving them a new nature. The heart is the source of our thoughts and disposition, really all of our actions. From the heart flows the springs of life, the proverb says. And under the new covenant, God's law governs that. He, he changes the heart so that what flows from it flows in the right direction. He corrects the heart. He corrects the mind and the will and enables it to obey. In Ezekiel 36 and verse 26, the same thing is promised. It's another passage on this great covenant. It's put in different words. The Lord said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I, will move, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, give you a living, responsive heart. Only God can do that. There's a legend that when Michelangelo finished his marble masterpiece of Moses, sitting with the Ten Commandments under his arm, it was so real and lifelike that he struck the statue's knee with his hammer and said, now speak. It didn't. It stayed marble. Dead stone. And our hearts do too. Nothing can change that. We can't give ourselves life. We can't give ourselves hearts of obedience. We can't with commands or hammers or anything. But God can And God does. It is all sovereign grace. It is an operation performed solely by the Holy Spirit who breathes life into us. Ezekiel 36, verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. That is a description of the new birth. It's what John writes of in In John chapter 1, verse 13, being born of God, what Jesus spoke of when he spoke to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, being born again. It's what Paul writes of in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, the washing of regeneration. 
the cleansing work of God in salvation. He slays the old man and makes us a new person with, with new understanding and new affections. He transforms our, our, our rational and moral being. We have spiritual perception that we didn't have. We see things differently. We see God in Scripture, in His goodness and holiness and beauty, and we love Him, and we want to know Him more, and we want to obey Him, and we do. Now, I say that. That's essentially true. And most importantly to understand here, God enables us to obey. Causes you to walk in obedience, but... Of course, it's not perfect obedience. And we will never have perfection this side of the grave and this side of glory. Not perfect yet. We still struggle with sin that is in us. Paul speaks very, speaks at length of this in Romans chapter 7. But but now we have something we didn't have before. We have a new heart. We have new abilities. We have new desires. We desire to live perfectly even though we don't. We have a new nature. And we're justified. That means we have been declared righteous. We are right with God through faith alone. You can't become any more accepted by God than you are at the moment of faith when He imputes to the believer the righteousness of Christ. There's nothing more to do to gain acceptance with God. But of course, from that point on, one wants to live in more obedience and conformity to the image of Christ. And so... We're being sanctified. Can't even do that on our own. God must do the work of sanctification, and He is doing that. He's changing us and conforming us to the image of Christ. Now, the external law could not do that. It could not cause Israel to walk in God's statutes. Apart from the Holy Spirit, the law is burdensome, and the law aggravates. Paul makes that point. In Romans 7, it stirs up sin within us. Fallen man rebels against its demands and threats. The promise of the new covenant is that those who are under it will obey God, not out of duty or dread, but from a God-given desire and ability to obey. One of the commentators wrote, under the new covenant, obeying will be as normal as, and as readily accepted as breathing and eating. It's a liberal commentator that made that point, but he understood well the point that is made here in Jeremiah. <clears throat> as a result of the change, the Lord says of Israel and Judah, I will be their God and they shall be my people, meaning they will be a believing people. They'll no longer be a rebellious people. They will come to Christ and know Him and, and, and walk with Him. That's the, the promise of this covenant. That's the, the promise of reconciliation. Israel will be reconciled to God. They are not now, but they will be. They'll be at peace with Him. They'll be united with Him. The branches that have been broken off of the olive tree will be grafted into it. That's the prophecy. And they will know the Lord. Not just know the facts about the Lord, as important as that is, by the way. But they will know Him personally. And the more they know the facts about the Lord, the more they will know Him personally. But that's the idea here. They will know Him personally. He will be their God through faith, and they will walk with Him. And that special knowledge will be widespread. Widespread. Not just for a few, but for a multitude. In verse 34, he said, They will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. And they will know him because they will be made right with him. They will all be forgiven. Notice this great statement at the end of verse 34. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. That's an amazing promise. I can imagine the Apostle Paul thinking on that promise often. When he was Rabbi Saul persecuting the church, he was there when they stoned Stephen to death, gave his approval. His hand was in it. He arrested and imprisoned Christians, took parents away from their children, husbands from wives, and gave them over to the executioner. 
He hated them because he hated Christ. And he would have killed him, would have killed our Lord all over again if he could have gotten his hands on him. That might have haunted Paul and seeing Stephen's face in his memory. I can imagine that. That would come before him, trouble him, what he had done. And see that face of Stephen as he looked up to heaven and breathed his last. But he knew, he knew that having been brought into this glorious new covenant, all of that has been forgiven. And not only that, it has been forgotten, never to be recalled again, cast behind God's back. And he, Paul, was to forget it, reckon it done, because Christ had paid for it and blotted it out through his death. The blood of bulls and goats, the sacrifices of the old covenant couldn't do that. Only Christ could and Christ did. That's the sufficiency and the efficiency of his sacrifice. What we today have as believers in Jesus Christ, the Jews will someday have by the grace of God. Their past apostasy, their past unbelief will be replaced with fidelity. And they will enter into the new covenant. That is his plan for them. That is what he is promising in the chapter. He cannot lie. He cannot be frustrated in his purpose. And he gives that assurance in the next verses. In fact, to make his point, he likens the unchangeable nature of his love for Israel to the fixed order of nature. It, it, will, it will break down before his love will. Verse 35, thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation forever before me. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out, then I will also cast off the offspring of Israel for, what they have, for all they have done, declares the Lord. This description of God's unchanging, unfailing, unconditional love is addressed to Israel. So it is a promise that Israel has a future. If the moon can, can, can cease to shine or the sun stop coming up in the morning, then there's no hope for Israel. But the point is that's not going to happen. God is presently preserving the nation for that future day that He speaks of here. The sun won't rise tomorrow and the sky will fall before God rejects Israel and it stops being a nation. The point is Israel's existence as a nation is as permanent as the fixed creation and the fixed order of things. One of the commentators, F.B. Huey, who was a former professor of Old Testament at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary wrote in his commentary on Jeremiah, the preservation of the Jewish people today is inexplicable apart from acknowledging that, that divine will has preserved them. I agree. Now it's risky, I think, to try to prove prophecy from current events, but still the existence of the Jew today after two millennia of persecution can only be explained as supernatural. Their whole history is supernatural. But the fact that the Jewish people are back in the land of Israel and speaking Hebrew, which was basically a dead language till 100, 150 years ago, is a miracle of history. Now these things don't prove the point, but they certainly give strong support for this text and others. But this text is not only about Israel. It's about God. It's about His promises and His faithfulness to them. And it has direct application to us. It has direct application to the church, to all God's elect. His promise not to forsake His chosen people Israel is as true of us 
his chosen church as it is for them. The Lord can no more forsake us than he can forsake them. The sky will fall before that happens. Christ said of his people, I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. He promised his disciples, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Paul told the Philippians, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He wrote in Romans 8, verses 37 through 39, that we are more than conquerors and that nothing at all will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. God said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. The list of promises goes on and on. God is true to his word. His promises never fail. Even though this this great text in Jeremiah 31 was written for Israel, we can claim it for ourselves. We've been grafted into that covenant. So we can sing, summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature and manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness. And again... God's great faithfulness to Israel, in spite of its rebellion and millennia of unbelief, means, according to Romans 11, verse 26, that someday all Israel will be saved. And that will be great blessing for the whole world. If their unbelief meant blessing to Gentiles, Paul asked, how much more their fulfillment Well, that glorious age to come is what is described in the final verses of the chapter in verses 38 through 40, <clears throat> where the rebuilding of Jerusalem is described in very specific terms. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city will be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. The measuring line will go out farther straight ahead to the hill of Gareb, Then it will turn to Goa. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes, and all the fields as far as the book of Kidron, to the corner of the horse gate toward the east, shall be holy to the Lord. It will will not be plucked up or overthrown anymore forever. This describes the preparation uh, for restoration of Jerusalem for the Messianic kingdom. It would be rebuilt and purified. The great transformation of that city is specifically indicated in the description, the whole valley of the dead bodies. That's the valley of Hinnom, the valley where Jewish children, sons and daughters, were made sacrifices on pagan altars and their ashes scattered in the valley. That stain will be removed. The people whose ancestors did that will never return to such sin and abomination again. The the city will be cleansed. The people will be purified. They will be made saints. And so the chapter ends. The city, Jerusalem, and the people will never fall again. It will not be plucked up or overthrown anymore forever. You remember back in chapter 1 when God called Jeremiah, he appointed him to pluck up and to break down. And the burden of his ministry was one of judgment, but he also was appointed to build and to plant. And that means he would prophesy these things. And because he prophesied God's word, it was certain to happen. God's word cannot fail. That's the future, a glorious kingdom to come. It is certain. It's the kingdom promised to Israel, but again, it's our future as well. We will have a place in that kingdom. This life is not all there is. We can be fooled into thinking and living like that. But this is it. And the goals of this life are the main thing about life. No. What is to come is more important. So that what we do today counts for tomorrow. And wisdom is found in living that way. So how are you living today? 
If you're a part of the new covenant, you are blessed more than you know. Just as God will transform Jerusalem from a bloody city to a pure place, He will do that for you. In fact, if you're in that covenant, if the Spirit of God is within you, He is doing that now. And it is all of grace from beginning to end. He chose you from eternity past. He, he bought you for Himself through the sacrifice of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in time, the Holy Spirit brought you to faith and to the Lord. Now, as people of the new covenant, we're being transformed by the Holy Spirit. That's the work of sanctification. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul described this as the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He makes us adequate. He makes us more than adequate. The Old Covenant couldn't do that. Paul said, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And ends the chapter by saying that as we study God's Word, as we listen, as we obey, the Spirit transforms us from glory to glory. He conforms us to the image of Christ and He empowers us to be fruitful with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and all of the virtues of Christ and makes us able to be a blessing to others. Through obedience, He gives us knowledge of God, love of His holiness, devotion to His Son and enthusiasm for His kingdom and His cause. And so we do that. We follow that. We enter into that and serve Him gladly. Christ established the new covenant in His blood. And all who enter that covenant through faith in Him and His sacrifice are being transformed now and have the hope of the glory to come. We are blessed people. May we serve Him with the time that we have left in this world. If you've not believed in Christ, we invite you to do so. It's not a, a, not a casual invitation. Don't misunderstand. It's urgent. It's very urgent. Life is short. You may be gone tomorrow. Don't leave this world unforgiven. Don't leave this world trusting in your own goodness. You have none, at least none before God. Join yourself to Christ and His righteousness through faith. He receives all who do. He imparts to them His forgiveness and righteousness that makes us acceptable to God and makes us His children forever. God help you to do that. Well, let's end with a hymn, one that I really enjoy. Hymn number 47 in the Songs of Praise book, Oh, the Love of My Redeemer. And then let's remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 47. Father, we give You great thanks for the love of the Redeemer. We thank You for the love of our great triune God. It's unconditional. It snatched us like brands from the fire. You redeemed us through the blood of Your Son. We thank You for that. Give us greater understanding of Your grace and Your love for us that we might love You more and serve You faithfully. Father, we pray now that You bless our time of fellowship in the lunch that follows. Bless our time together. We thank you for Christ, for your grace and your mercy that's given us all that we have. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.